Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. Hey, guys. Good morning. Is it still morning? Oh, good afternoon. It's 1210. Okay. Um, finishing. This is the last episode in the 30 Years War series, and then I'm going to finish the last episode in the Caesar series on Kings in General. And then, guys, I've, I have not been doing as many uh, recommendations as I should have in the Discord. That ends now, all right? And I'll continue with shout-outs and all that, that good stuff. Mark my word. My words. All right, let's do it. Original link to the video, top of the description below. The link to the Discord, right below that. Get, today's the last date for the voting. I think... Um, Great Northern War is in quite a bit of a lead, however. But uh, definitely join the Discord if you, you know, just makes it easier for me to interact with you. You're not, you're, you're obviously a part of the family if you're, if you're subscribed on Discord or not. It just, it makes it easier for me to talk with you guys and uh, see what you want and all that good stuff if you're on the Discord. Love for you to join over there. The more the merrier. Pull up a chair. You're always welcome. Let's do it. If you're not ready to learn, home mech is down the hall. Get out. Make me some mac and cheese or something. Let's go. We can't believe that this day is finally here, but today we're releasing the final episode of our series on the Thirty Years' War. As Let's all go! sides were by now exhausted, the armies tried to score victories in order to strengthen the position of their diplomats at the negotiation table. This led to two battles on two faraway fronts, as the French and Spaniards fought at Law while the Swedes attacked Prague. I'm With an idiot, I right. far away fronts, as the French and Spaniards fought at Law while the Swedes attacked Prague. Okay. With oh, half maps. of Bavaria under Franco-Swedish control, Elector Maximilian continued sending panicked letters to the Emperor Ferdinand, asking him for reinforcements or to end the war. However, there were no armies to spare, so the Emperor continued demanding that his diplomats get a peace deal and sent his own letters to his cousin, the King of Spain, Philip, pleading for help. The Habsburg monarch had problems of his own. Portugal and Catalonia were fighting for their independence, supported by the French, and the situation was critical in the east, as Conde was operating here. Thankfully, things were about to change. Political circumstances in France were growing tense as the higher nobility was unhappy with Mazarin's centralization efforts, while the lower classes and the parliament were protesting the tax burden brought by war. Commander of the French troops in Flanders, Gaston Sorry. of Orléans, was one of the leaders of the Commander of the French troops in Flanders, Gaston of Orléans, was one of the leaders of the aristocrats, and he returned to Paris to take part in the events. The Dutch Republic had been passive in its war against Spain for some time now, as the two sides fought to a bloody standstill, and with the death of their leader, Frederick Henry, in 1647, the desire to continue fighting faded even more. Despite the protests of Frederick Henry's son, William II, six out of seven Dutch provinces voted in favour of peace. In January 1648, Spain and the Dutch Republic signed the Peace of Munster, ending the Eighty Years' War between them. This freed up the 25,000-strong army under Archduke Leopold to attack the French, and he started doing just that to force Conde to leave Catalonia. The French leader was moving fast and recruiting on the go, but before he arrived at the front, the Archduke used the inaction of the French Marshal Ronceau to besiege the strategically crucial Cordray in April. However, the Spaniards got bogged down, as the heavily outnumbered garrison proved to be stalwart. This bought Condé enough time to reach the region, 
bringing the total strength of the French armies to 23,000, comparable to the Spanish. To get a supply line for Courtrai, Condé attacked Ypres on May 12th, and the city fell 10 days later. Still, Condé didn't have enough time to reinforce Courtrai, and it was conquered by Leopold on the 23rd. In June and July, armies manoeuvred around, wrestling for position, and the French commander sent a contingent under Ranzeau to attack Ostend. However, the Spaniards were able to read the situation. Their detachment, commanded by Fuensaldaña, managed to ambush and destroy Ranzeau's troops to the north of Dixmud. This handcuffed Condé, and the enemy now had a numerical advantage so he failed to stop another Spanish unit under Sfondretti from taking Fjern in early August. The French commander was unusually patient, and for a good reason. His long-term captain, Johann von Erlach, was marching from Germany with 3,000 fresh reinforcements. Leopold used that to march to Vanaton, 40 kilometers away from the French positions at Bethune. On the 12th of August, he moved south, leaving detachments to keep an eye on the enemy garrisons, and two days later, his vanguard clashed with the French defending the crossing of the river La Lore. On the 15th, the Spanish Archduke decided to take law in order to cut Condé from his supply base at Arras and continued south. Condé united with Erlac on the next day and started chasing the Spaniards. On the 17th, the Spanish army reached Long and besieged it using part of their forces. The garrison was small and had little hope to resist for long, and Leopold's troops immediately started bombarding the walls of the city. The French arrived at the scene by the end of the day. Condé wanted to relieve the defenders immediately, but the Spaniards... It's a really nice artillery position. Condé wanted to relieve the defenders immediately, but the Spaniards knew of his approach from their scouts and turned most of their forces north just in time to prevent the foe from attacking. Their army now occupied a hill to the northeast of the village of Lievon, a position that even the bold Condé didn't dare to attack head on. On the 18th, Condé ordered his army to form up between the villages of Grenet and Luce, hoping that his counterparts would take the bait and attack. But Leopold, or most probably his chief officer Beck, ignored it. Left with no support, the garrison of Law resisted the Spanish assaults for a day, but this was futile, and early on the 19th they finally capitulated. A small unit was left in Law, while the rest of the attackers joined the main body. The leader of the French army found himself in a difficult situation. Law was critical for the supply lines connecting Arras to the recently conquered <laughs> and look at the big hill they got. For the supply Art. lines connecting Arras to the recently conquered Bethune and La Basse, but there was no way to reclaim it at the moment. At the same time, the French marched to Law double time, leaving their supplies in La Basse, so the army was growing hungry. The obvious choice was to reposition to Arras, which was to the south. But Condé wasn't eager to cede territory, and instead, in the early morning of the 20th, commanded his army into marching columns and started moving north. It seems that the Spanish leadership didn't want to go after the retreating foe immediately, but a few cavalry squadrons of Ligneville were sent to scout ahead at 5.30 a.m., and they managed to surprise the French rearguards due to the darkness. Without much of a fight, the rearguards dispersed, and Ligneville crashed into the personal guard of Condé. The French general was almost captured, but barely escaped and fell back behind the approaching infantry battalions. Overextended and facing more opposition, the Spanish commander returned to his position. The Spanish leadership was extremely encouraged by this small victory, and Beck, who was the most experienced Spanish general, wanted to avenge the defeat at Roqua, was pressuring Leopold into allowing him to attack Condé, Rock and forward. he got permission at 7 a.m. The Archduke left the army immediately afterwards. On the other end of the field, the French commander realized that retreating through open terrain might be deadly, 
so he ordered his troops to get into fighting formation to the east of the village of Mazongabre. The Battle of Law, pitting Beck and Condé against each other for the second time after Roqua, began at 8am on August 20th, 1648. The Spanish army consisted of 9,000 infantry in 16 battalions, the majority of them from Spain, but also from Germany, Italy, Flanders, and even Ireland, alongside... What is the caliber of that bullet? I mean, seems like a very, very small cannon. Sorry. Isn't caliber the width of the bullet? 9,000 infantry in 16 battalions, the majority of them from Spain, but also from Germany, Italy, Flanders, and even Ireland, alongside 9,000 cavalry in 60 squadrons, mostly from Wallonia and Lorraine. They also had 38 guns. The French had 7,000 footmen divided between 12 battalions, most of them from France. Sorry, it looks like there are ridges too, sorry. 7,000 footmen divided between 12 battalions, most of them from France, with battalions from Scotland, Switzerland and Italy, while their cavalry totaled 9,000 split into 45 squadrons. Although the French had just 18 cannons, their artillery technology and officers were superior. It should also be noted that the Spanish battalions and squadrons had fewer soldiers than those of the French. It seems like the French and the Swedish especially are just ahead above everyone else in terms of uh, techno the technology they have, you know. The armies were slowly getting closer to technology, just the, the quality of guns and equipment and tactics. The armies were slowly getting closer to each other. Beck left his cannons on top of the hill, Good. defended by a few squadrons hopeful that the height would allow them to inflict damage, but Go the further. few volleys they fired were ineffective Short. and missed. Unlike his conduct at Roqua, the Spanish commander was acting hastily, and that led to disorder in his lines. The mobile French cannon- Can I ask something? Uh, so... When does the artillery go from go to more of a vertical, not completely vertical, but like an 80 degrees, 70s, you know, a certain incline that you think of mortars in the First and Second World War, where you're not exactly shooting right at them, you're going at a high angle, and you're, you know, calibrating it to get the right position. I just wonder when it artillery took that change from the cannon to more of a mortar i'm not great with military terminology i'm trying to get better i, I hope you understood kind of what i mean made the descent from the hill to disorder in his lines the mobile french cannons made the descent from the hill even more complicated killing many by the time the spaniards reached their intended positions to the east of Grenay, their lines were in chaos beck commanded the center made up of two echelons, with seven squadrons and ten battalions in the first line, and two squadrons and six battalions in the second, most of the infantry in Tertios. On the left he had Lineville with twenty cavalry units from Lorraine in two echelons, while the right was made up of Bouquois' twenty-seven Walloon squadrons in two lines. In contrast, Condé knew that both he and the enemy had no choice but to fight, so he wasn't in a hurry, and on a few occasions his troops stopped to even the lines. During one of these stops, the commander gave a short speech. Friends, do you remember Roqua, Fribourg, Nordlingen? You must win or die. You will walk in one line. You will retain your order of battle, no matter what. Aye, aye, his sir. artillery continued to soften up the opposition, until the French made it to the designated position between Mazongabre and Luce. Grammont was the leader of 16 squadrons in two echelons on the left, while Gaspard de Coligny was leading the center in two echelons with a mix of infantry and cavalry and the six squadron cavalry reserve behind it. Condé, who personally commanded the right, made up of 17 squadrons, noticed that the Spanish flank opposing him was in disarray and immediately ordered his troops to attack. Uh. At 8.30 a.m., 
the French were within pistol range, but suddenly stopped their advance. Yeah. In this period, line battles were often decided by psychological matters. I don't know if the that's a good idea. The unit who took the first volley was often exposed to enemy counterattack, and Condé managed to stop his soldiers from firing. The Lorrainers were first to blink, and although their volley did cause damage, the French took it in their stride and avenged their fallen comrades with a lethal charge. In a okay. matter of minutes, the first echelon of the Spanish left was dispersed. The second line countercharged, and despite Condé's personal bravery, were able to stop his... It's hard to gauge exactly how far these two groups, you know, the big center group is from their left flank and the, you know, the French right side. I, I figured... You know, if this if if this guy went in like he did, then with your army way back there, they might be able to attack. Maybe they don't want to ruin formation, or maybe it's just a further distance than I than I think. Countercharged, and despite Condé's personal bravery, were able to stop his horsemen. But Erlac, who read the situation perfectly, brought his reserve cavalry forward and attacked Lineville from the left. Attacked from the front and flank, the Lorrainers weren't able to hold for long, and by 9am were fleeing. The leader of the Spanish right, Bouqua, was a veteran of countless battles against the French, and he was used to the daring charges of their cavalry, which were usually countered by pistol or musket volleys, and then swords. However, Grammont decided to change this rhythm. To the surprise of the Walloon horsemen, the French gallop stopped just within musket range, and as the officers were still not able to form up their troops, they discharged the volley, which was ineffective. Immediately after that, Grammont charged into the enemy, and after a short engagement, the Walloons broke and were driven off the field. After 9.30am, Grammont and Condé met in the vicinity of Lievon, and then charged uphill, dispersing the Spanish reserves and taking their artillery. In the center, the battle was much more difficult for the French. Initially, they attacked the Spanish center and successfully pushed back the line. But at some point, the French and Swiss Guard regiments became the victims of their own success. They I wonder what you guys think was more of a capable army, the French or the Swedish? They the French and Swiss Guard regiments became the victims of their own success. They advanced too much, and when the Spanish cavalry in the center counterattacked, the rest of the French centre was forced to retreat, and these three battalions were basically surrounded. Taking heavy casualties, the guard units slowly retreated, but the Spaniards were chasing and pushed beyond the second French centre echelon, taking over the enemy artillery. Thankfully for the French, buoyed by the Scottish and Picardy regiments, they were able to reform their lines and stop the Spanish advance. That is when the Spanish center realized that its flanks were gone and it would soon be attacked from all sides. While cavalry squadrons and the infantry that was on the left managed to break away and retreat, the majority of the center was entrapped by Conde and Grammont. Unlike Roqua, there was no lengthy resistance and Beck's units surrendered. The commander himself was heavily wounded and became a prisoner of war dying 10 days later, despite the efforts of the French surgeons. The Spanish losses were between six and 10,000, depending on the source, while the French casualties were around 3,000. This was the greatest victory Condé gained in his illustrious career, his Austerlitz and Breitenfeld. Some French chroniclers claim that his move to the north was a feint to draw the enemy from the defensible position. In any case, Condé and Grammont's talent Erlach's timely attacks and the superiority of the French cavalry decided the fate of this battle. I gotta take a piss, guys. Be right back. Okay, sorry. Back. Superiority of the French cavalry decided the fate of this battle. It seemed that nothing could stop Condé's conquest of the Spanish Netherlands, but events were transpiring back in the capital. Emboldened by the victory at Law, Mazarin arrested the leaders of the parliament and it backfired as Paris did what it does best. The populace revolted and the barricades rose in the streets, starting a five-year insurgency called Front.
you gotta give it to the French. They don't take crap. <laughs> Are they? They. They're they're French. I mean that in a good way. Immediately, the nobles attempted to use that to weaken the absolute monarchy and demanded the Estates General to be called. The situation became so volatile. That the 10 year old Louis XIV, his mother, and Mazarin were forced to leave the city. Mazarin immediately ordered his diplomats in Munster to finalize the negotiations, while Conde was asked to march back and take Paris from the rebels. Rulers always try to use military force to strengthen their diplomatic positions, and this war was no different. So Sweden was looking for its own massive victory to get a better deal from the Emperor. As we mentioned before, Königsmark was sent towards Bohemia to reinforce the Swedish forces under Prince Charles Gustav. Things were improving on this front for the Swedes for some time, as most of the Imperial forces were concentrated in Bavaria, while the Imperial commander in the region, Gallus, became too ill to lead the army and was dismissed in late 1647 allowing Carl Gustav to send a portion of his army under Wittenberg to take over parts of eastern Bohemia and the Moravian capital, Olomouc. On top of that, Emperor Ferdinand's marriage celebrations and the news that peace was almost concluded somewhat relaxed the tired imperial forces. In late July, en route to assist Wittenberg, Königsmark had another encounter with Ernest Odowalski, a former imperial colonel, dismissed without payment and now keen to have his revenge. Odowalski told the Swedish commander that the defences of Prague were lax and the city was ripe for the taking. Königsmark had only 3,000 troops under his command, but he thought that would be enough, as the majority of the Prasins were Protestant, and he thought that they would be eager to get rid of the Emperor's Catholic yoke. In reality, the Czechs loathed the conduct of the Swedish troops during the previous campaigns in their country, and now saw the Emperor as the guarantor of peace and stability. Königsmark's first moves didn't help. Instead of approaching the city peacefully, the Swedish leader listened to the wrathful colonel, deciding to attack to get the Czechs' submission. The Swedish colonel deciding to attack to get the Czechs submission. The Swedes advanced to the city from the west and were noticed by the commander of the city, Field Marshal Rudolf von Colorado. Part of the 2,000 strong garrison was ordered to reinforce the western walls of the city. Odowalski, who was stationed in Prague before, knew its weak points and the fact that the western walls of the city were being reinforced but the works were not over. The construction rubble, left under the northwestern corner of the wall, made scaling possible, and Otovalski, accompanied by his 100... Kings and Generals has gotten so good at making their maps and, like, you know, these layouts. ...the wall, made scaling possible, and Otovalski, accompanied by his 100 men, did just that under the cover of darkness at 2 a.m. on July 26th. The defenders were still unaware, so the colonel divided his unit into two groups and took over the bastions to the left and the right of this portion of the fortifications. Nicely he then done. rushed south and attacked the guards of the Strahov Monastery Gate from the rear and opened the gates for the cavalry of Königsmark. Nicely done. That is when the garrison finally realized that the city was under attack. Colorado sent his second-in-command, Schmidt, to learn what was going on, but he was killed in Pohojolets. Some of the guards attempted to defend in the area, others decided that it was time to leave the western portion of the city, but neither group succeeded, as the Swedes were able to take over the Manns and Charles bridges. Most of the defenders were cut down, and although Colorado He's lost swimming? as much as half of the garrison, How did he get across? Did he swim? And although Colorado lost as much as half of the garrison, 
he managed to get on a boat and cross the Vltava River. So often, if I just shut up and listen, my, my question will be answered. Fortunately for him, the portion of the city the Swedes just occupied was full of riches, as the gifts nobles were sending were collected there, which meant that for two days, the attackers were only interested in looting. That gave the field marshal an opportunity to create defences on both bridges, call for the citizens to take up arms, and ask the nearby... Worry about looting later. You know all it takes is one or two guys getting some really nice stuff for other people to be like, well, if I don't loot now, then everything will be gone. And then it starts, I'm sure it starts a chain reaction. You need complete discipline in your army or else one or two bad guys can start a chain reaction of looting and then you forget about your main objective. Come on. On both bridges, call for the citizens to take up arms and ask the nearby Imperial forces for reinforcements. Students of the universities, priests and other locals flocked to his banners and more regular troops under Field Marshal Pukheim arrived, bringing the total number of the defenders to at least 5,000. Although taking the western portion of Prague was a feat of bravery and a great victory, the lack of discipline and looting didn't allow Königsmark to conquer the whole city. With his mostly cavalry army, he had almost no hope of taking the bridges, and even though he captured the Imperial cannons, he could only use them to shell the city, as he needed the bridges intact. This shelling caused some casualties. Why not um, destroy the bridges if you're on the... Uh on this eastern side. But not nearly enough to break the resolve of the defenders. In another example of historical irony, the Czechs who started the active phase of the Thirty Years' War by defying the Emperor were about to fight in the final battle of the conflict on his side. It's been a hell of a journey, boys and girls. On the 30th, Love you all. a 5,000 strong Swedish corps under Wittenberg arrived from the east, putting pressure on the defenders and forcing them to divide their forces. Shelled from the western side of the Vlatava and attacked from the east, the Czechs still managed to defend and inflict casualties on Wittenberg. Königsmark attempted to use his paltry number of infantry to cross the bridges, but this too failed. Seeing that not much could be achieved, on August 4th, Wittenberg and his troops left the area around the city to raid the countryside. By now, Emperor Ferdinand had learned of the Siege of Prague and ordered his diplomats to get a peace deal with the Swedes as soon as possible. That wasn't helpful for the Czechs, as their supply situation was deteriorating, which Sorry. meant his diplomat. Now, Emperor Ferdinand had learned of the Siege of Prague and ordered his diplomats to get a peace deal with the Swedes as soon as possible. That wasn't helpful for the Czechs, as their supply situation was deteriorating, which meant that foragers had to be sent out of the city. This wasn't safe, and in one such foraging mission, Pukheim and a few hundred of his troops were defeated by Wittenberg in the open field. The relative lull, interrupted by the Swedish guns from time to time, continued until October 4th, when Wittenberg returned and besieged the northeastern portion of the walls once again. This time he was joined by his superior, Charles Gustav, who took position to the south and southeast with his 6,000, bringing the total of the attackers to 14,000, which meant that they now had the decisive numerical superiority. For the next 20 days, the Swedes attacked the city from three sides, managing to destroy the eastern walls in three places. The troops were sent to penetrate the city through these gaps, but the Czechs stood tall, wreaking havoc on the attackers. It was clear that this couldn't continue for long. The Swedes were gaining ground, and new portions of the wall were being wrecked. Still, to avoid more casualties, the Swede prince decided to start negotiations with Colorado promising that the garrison would be allowed to leave the city and the citizens would be unharmed. A back and forth followed, as the imperial leader was trying to buy time. Finally, Charles Gustav realized that he was being played and broke off the talks. 
On the 24th, the Westphalian peace treaty was signed, but neither side knew about it at the moment, so on the next day, another general assault was ordered. Once again, the Swedes were able to punch through in the area between the horse and mountain gates. 6,000 elite Swedish footmen kept in reserve were then commanded to enter the city. They were initially successful, pushing the defenders back, but the narrow front gave the Czechs an opportunity to counterattack the enemy, and the Swedish assault was stopped around the second line of makeshift fortifications. Finally, on the 26th, both the Swedes and Colorado were informed about the peace. On paper, Charles Gustav had to lift the siege of the city, but he pretended to be oblivious. Four days later, the prince offered a surprise Colorado a chance to surrender, but was refused yet again. His troops were sent forth to attack the city, but this attack was half-hearted and didn't even advance beyond Wait, the war. So Sunder. four days later, the siege of the I city. I made it through with not that many pauses. I, I can the pause. Peace. So. On the 26th, both the Swedes and Colorado were informed about the peace. On paper, Charles Gustav had to lift the siege of the city, but he pretended to be oblivious. Four days later, the prince offered a surprise Colorado a chance to surrender, but was... So, the peace was signed, they didn't know it at first, and so there was a, an offensive, technically, after the peace was signed. That's to be expected. I mean, communication is not fast at all in these times, and of course it's going to happen. But then they do hear about it, and so they both back off. And then the Prince of Sweden says, well, no, I still want to fight, so here, just surrender. So we can, I'm assuming, so we can loot or whatnot. And then he says no. was refused yet again. His troops were sent forth to attack the city, but this attack was half-hearted and didn't even advance beyond the walls like the previous ones. Right, imagine being ordered back in, it's like... I thought, I thought it's over. On November 5th, the Swedish commander learned of the approaching Imperial forces under Piccolomini and concluded that it was time to stop feigning ignorance. The siege was lifted and the Swedes left the vicinity of Prague with hefty loot. Nonetheless, the gallant defenders of Prague entered into history and probably prevented the Swedes from getting even more from the peace treaties. But what was the Peace of Westphalia? As we mentioned previously, diplomats were negotiating in the cities of Osnabrück and Münster for some time in the first ever example of a peace conference. I find that so cool um, that the entire time that, or maybe not the entire time the war is going on, but for a good chunk of the latter part of the war, um, there are politicians of both sides. I don't know if you call them politicians or what, just leaders of both sides negotiating peace and I find that very, very, a very cool part of war that I would like to learn more about. It'd be cool if there are any videos that are like strictly about the peace, that are strictly about those people, like talking on either side to, to try and get um, some kind of deal. And of course, when it's rejected, the, the fighting key, uh, continues. As these cities were in the region of Westphalia, the documents signed on October 24th, 1648, became collectively known as the Peace of Westphalia. According to it, the resolutions of the Peace of Augsburg of 1555 were confirmed, meaning that every prince of the Holy Roman Empire was allowed to change the denomination of their own state and choose between Catholicism, Lutheranism, and Calvinism, while the Christians of all denominations were allowed to worship according to what is Calvinism? A uh, major branch of Protestantism that follows the theological Christian, reform and Christian practice set down by John Calvin. I've obviously heard of it. I just okay. Their faith. All the Sinai countries agreed that the usage of mercenaries and privateers was an extension of their foreign policy. France and Sweden were declared the guarantors of the execution of the peace treaty, which meant that they could intervene in imperial affairs whenever they wanted. The old Swiss Confederacy, who leveraged its neutrality, and the Dutch Republic, who won a bloody war against Spain, 
were declared independent and outside the boundaries of the Holy Roman Empire. France was given the cities of Metz, Toul and Verdun in Lorraine, and nine out of the ten major cities in Alsace, save for Strasbourg, and this set up centuries of warfare between French and German polities, eventually leading to the World Wars. I love how this is the most gratifying part of all of this, of this whole journey I've been on. I started my reactions in January 2021. It's been a few months, eight or nine months, ten, nine months. And just it's it's these moments where you, you see things, uh, parts in history connect with each other and no, no period of history, no historical events sit in a vacuum. They're all connected. And this is one of the most gratifying moments uh, of watching these videos. Sweden received 5 million tellers of compensation, as well as part of Western Pomerania, Wismar, Bremen and Verden, while Gdansk was returned to Poland-Lithuania. Brandenburg, Prussia received Eastern Pomerania, but the border between the two Pomeranias was not determined, leading to future conflicts. Bavaria retained its vote in the Electoral College, but the new Prince Palatine Charles I Louis got the western portion of his family lands back, along with receiving the eighth vote in the Electoral College. Free trade was implemented on the River Rhine. The war between France and Spain wasn't concluded, despite all the efforts of the Emperor, meaning that Spain was now fighting France on its own, which weakened the Habsburg alliance. The Thirty Years' War was one of the bloodiest up until then, causing the death of at least 8 million people, most of them in Germany. But it didn't solve the issues. 8 million people it said, uh... was one of the bloodiest up until then, causing the death of at least 8 million people, most of them in Germany. But it didn't solve the issues that haunted both the Holy Roman Empire and Europe at large. And that led to the continuation of conflicts all over the continent. I wonder what that uh, death toll number, the casualty number, or death number, I know casualty can be injured as well. I wonder what that death number is if you inflate it to uh, represent, you know, the change in population. We're planning to eventually cover every major conflict of this era. You're so, so good, sure kings you in general. So subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Absolutely. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members. Whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This oh, they have is a Discord. the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one. That was a hell of a journey, guys. I very much enjoyed that. Again, I, I'm not the greatest learner, so um, I got terrible ADD. I have the attention span of a rock, but I it definitely helps me to learn to, you know, redundant. what might seem redundant to some people really is helpful to me in that this... I do not plan at all for this to be the last time I learn about the Thirty Years' War. All right, I've I've learned a lot. I knew almost nothing before, and you know this is just part. I'm in here for the long haul. All right, love for you guys to join. If you're not subscribed, hit all the buttons. Join the Discord. All right, polls end tonight for the next video. All right, see you guys next time. I'm gonna do the uh, Rome video right now.